So, brand purpose. Indeed. Let's kick off by saying why we do these Fashion Mash Lives and why we've done really quite a few of them now since the beginning of lockdown back in spring. It all goes back to our core business mission as Fashmash. Um, we're nearly nine years established now, and it is as true now as it was back then. It is to encourage open conversation and sharing of ideas to drive the industry forward. Indeed, and we've now held so many of these, what we've been calling Fashmash Focus roundtable discussions over the past six, seven, eight months now, I guess. Um, covering a huge array of topics from how to deal with the COVID crisis in the first instance to how to manage store reopenings when then that started becoming a reality in what, June, July mm. time, I guess. Yeah. And then to think about the myriad of different sustainability subtopics throughout that connect kind of all of these things together from storytelling to circularity, social justice and much, much more. And I'm really excited about tonight's conversation because I feel it kind of unites a lot of all of this in one place, you know, exploring mm. that underpinning theme of brand purpose and all that 2020 has brought us so i can't wait to dig in before we go any further we are very very proud to be sponsored by clavio they are an e-commerce marketing platform and they are for brands of all types and sizes from 111 skin in beauty to hummingbird bakery in the world of cakes they, whether it might be an email campaign or perhaps website personalization, the key thing that makes them different is precise targeting and insights. That's why over 50,000 brands globally trust them with their growth online and in e-commerce. We would love for you to give them a try. We think it's very, very relevant to lots of our audience. So just go to clavio.com forward slash fashmash. That is K-L-A-V-I-Y-O dot com forward slash fashmash. And you can start your free trial today. So, shall we dig in? I think we should dig in and I think we should begin as we always do with our inspiration. So Rachel, what is inspiring you this week? Okay, so my inspiration, I posted about this on Instagram, which loads of people have got in touch with me about actually, which has been really, really nice and on LinkedIn as well. Um, it's an article that appeared in Atmos magazine by Elizabeth Klein. I'm sure many of you know her as one of the um, leading um, authors in this space around sustainable fashion. Um, and her piece um, last week was called The Twilight of the Ethical Consumer. Really, really interesting, a long read, but really interesting one, can't recommend it more. Basically, she explores the idea that this, um, this, this notion of being a conscious shopper, which of course we've all been trying to be more and more, um, just isn't enough in terms of the actual amount of change that we need to see in the world. And instead, she suggests that what we need, the only route that we can sort of make towards true progress is via more evident forms of activism that hold both corporations and governments to account. Um, and she digs into some really strong examples from history where she says there were the most amazing amount of consumer driven social movements um, happening that wielded extraordinary amounts of political power and made lasting changes to society that still benefits us today. Um, and she reflects that on some of the key needs and challenges we're facing currently, that's the only th way that we're going to see any amount of movement. And of course, within that are things like climate, the climate crisis, systemic racism, growing inequality, and much, much more. So a very, very worthy read. Because that's my that's mine for this week. What about you? That's a great one. I've actually, since you sent that article to me, I've sent it to so many people and thrillingly, lots of them had actually already read it. So it's obviously getting, getting Doing a lot of traction. Rounds. Yeah, yeah. My inspiration comes from actually a lady who attended the focus roundtable that we had on this very topic on brand purpose. She is Anushka Dukas, MBE. She was back in the day founder of Links of London and now has her own brand, Anushka Jewelry. She is also, among her many hats, a patron of the Prince's Trust. And they have come up with this brilliant initiative this year. It is actually, I use the very adjective, brilliant breakfast. Um, mm -hmm. and it, is, it is all in aid of empowering women. Women are the most affected by the COVID-19 crisis. Um, just some stats that I've written down here, or rather some research. Uh, their research says that over half of young women say their anxiety has increased because of the crisis and that finding a job feels impossible. This is why it's more important than ever to support young women. 
Um, Anushka herself has raised nearly a quarter of a million through this brilliant breakfast initiative, which is astounding, particularly this year where it's obviously hard for everyone to fundraise and to donate. Um, Rachel and I are going to be ho hosting our own online breakfast this week. Sadly, it can't be in real life, but we're going to be discussing empowering women, which we feel is a crucial topic. And it's become particularly important to us since we launched the mentoring scheme as well. So that is inspiring me. And I'm really fired up for this week. For it this week. I'm, I'm very much looking forward to it. Um, so too. yeah, Rachel, I, I, yeah, exactly. Along with this, um, I think we need <laughs> to set the scene a little bit because brand purpose, I mean, I know that our friend who we saw this morning together, she was kind of like that. What does that even mean? Could you set it up for us a little bit? Yeah. I mean, so the word purpose itself has obviously long been something that we've talked about relative to the fashion industry's oh, yeah. exploration of everything to do with, you know, social, cultural, environmental issues. Um, we've seen that massively in the, as you said, nearly nine year history of um, Fashmash and its existence. And we've definitely seen it throughout the existence of social media. And that being, you know, the, the multitude of different social media platforms that brands have decided to have a voice on. So when we're talking about brand purpose, what we mean is some alignment to wider values than indeed just the selling of your products. And that tends to be p things that are aligned with people and planet primarily and everything that that touches in between. And the reason for having this conversation today is because, of course, there's never been a year quite like 2020 when it comes to these kind of topics. Um, today, brand purpose means probably more than we've ever previously seen, you know, in light of, of course, everything that's happened with the COVID crisis through to the Black Lives Matter movement, as well as a lot of other key moments in between everything else going on this year. And I think what we've seen is that it's been incredibly uniting in many, many ways, but it's also been phenomenally polarizing. Um, and it's made for some of the most important conversations we've ever had in this industry, I think, as a result, which is, which is why I'm excited to talk about it. I think it's interesting for us to explore how everyone has fared through it, where we've seen authenticity versus virtue signaling or success mm. versus cancel culture, of which there has, of course, also been a lot. And ultimately, what place we all believe that purpose should play in this world of marketing and branding today? You know, is there actually really a place for it? Does, should it exist? And, and kind of what's our view on that? So all of these things we're going to dig into that started with the roundtable discussions that we have with our members, those closed, those closed conversations. Um, and it was, the, I think, for both of us, I can fairly say that it was our most inspiring to date. It really was. Of us coming off, and, off of it and feeling really like we'd learned a lot and, and had so many insightful um, discussion points. So I can't wait to dig into it more. Rosanna, you're going to kick us off. This has been, as I said, a phenomenal year for all of this. As a marketer, I know you've been watching it so, so closely. What's been your view on, on, on the, whole, the whole picture, basically? Yeah, there's been the good, the bad and the ugly, hasn't there? I think... <laughs> yeah, there has. <laughs> To kick off this conversation, we the we have to examine the black squares because I actually think that this affected um, people not only on a brand scale but on a personal level. And the the afflictions were the same whether you were at a brand or whether you were in it was your personal account. Is it better to say nothing at all? Are you crowding the space? Are you taking a voice away from a black voice that needs to be heard right now? Is it purely performative? Is it tokenistic? The debate that came up around the black squares was utterly, it was, it was fascinating. And I think it was actually really important. I think it got a lot of people talking, um, which is crucial, obviously, always. Um, a black square with no action since, I think, is one of the worst pieces of marketing. In fact, I know it's one of the worst pieces of marketing of 2020. And there are many examples of that. Um, I'm sure lots of you have seen them, whether it's a celebrity or it might be a smaller brand. I, they're there on the on the feed still, but nothing's come up since. No campaign has changed. No um, talk about diversity internally. None of that has, see, has seen any change. Um, but then there have been authentic actions in this space. Most recently, the Share the Mic campaign, which was um, everyone from musicians to actors to writers to journalists taking over um, or rather swapping both their grid and stories with a black woman for a day. It was very, very impactful. And I was really delighted to see the engagement on that as well. Yeah. Um, and then let's talk about brands. Um, first of all, I think it has to be said, L'Oreal, 
which really hit the headlines back then. Um, this is a huge multinational corporation. They posted a black square. They were called out by everyone from customers to huge influencers to celebrities for their treatment of activist Monroe Bergdorf, who was, it made the headlines back in 2017. She was the first trans transgender model to front one of their campaigns. However, when she spoke out about white supremacy, she was promptly dropped and in her words, thrown to the dogs. Um, and that needed to be called out. Now, mm. it may have taken them longer than ideal. Um, there were, the comments just went on and on and on with influencers saying, when are you gonna, because they did subsequent posts after the Black Square as well. But then eventually um, the president spoke to Monroe. I think it was actually in fact a Zoom call and it was broadcast. And then she's now part of their UK diversity and inclusion advisory board. So positive action and change. Um, I also do really want to talk about Fashmash right now. And I think Rachel, probably you agree this is an opportune moment too, because as two white privileged women, we have to confront this. Um, and we felt a, a need to back in June. And we put a lot of time and thought into our first statement. And understandably, that had that we received comments and we deserved those comments. Um, and, you, you know, we've kept them on the feed. You guys are welcome to go back and read them. But then, honestly, one of the best things that happened to me this year was following up with those comments and saying to the people, let's have a Zoom call. Let's discuss this. And it was so fascinating for me and Rachel to hear as founders um, a, I think public perception of Fashmash, B, how we can improve um, and, and kind of see just this, we almost hadn't realized the public perception because to me and Rachel, I think it's still just little Fashmash that we founded eight <laughs> years ago. And there were things that we really urgently needed to change. So we launched a Fashmash Young Pioneers on mentoring scheme, which is off the back of Black Lives Matter and COVID-19. It has a focus on ethnic minorities and those from low socioeconomic backgrounds. I'm delighted to say we have 12 talented individuals now as mentees that honestly, the future of fashion is safe in their hands. And we're going to be working, well, our mentors will be working with them closely as well as us. And then we're also very, very lucky that Frederica Brooksworth is now on board um, to advise us and consult for us on the scheme. She brings a wealth of experience. And I feel that we're in a much stronger place having actioned um, everything that came about from June. Uh, Rachel, do you, I'm sure you agree. <laughs> yeah, I do. Of course I agree. Yeah, massively. I think, I think for us, you know, and, and, and going back to the beginning of the sort of lockdown period as well, it was, mm. uh, I don't want to say an amazing opportunity because it, it sort of, it sounds inappropriate, but it, but it was in many ways to take a long, hard look at ourselves, which I think lots of people have talked about doing exactly that. And, and the other side of things that we massively changed was the, membership um mm. part of Fashmash, yeah. which previously unintentionally but very much was elitist in the sense that you know it was it was focused on people that were senior in the industry where we're in a particular division and when we sat down and we said you know why do we exist what what are our objectives you know we've never really thought of this purely or truly as a business we've thought of mm. it as you know little Fashmash, as you said um and actually it's nice to write down some objectives write down a strategy mm. and talk about what we're here for and what we're here for really about facilitating that notion of change and helping shape the future and if you want to change things you cannot do it just by focusing on the people that are already in roles and in the most senior roles exactly. because it doesn't bring you diversity of thought besides anything else so opening up our membership base has been phenomenal for us as well because we've met so many new and interesting people that um to your point building on that mentee pool is really important to what this industry needs to look like down the line and both of us in our own private work as well as what we do with fashion Match, are really heavily focused on how to drive change so um yeah it's been it's been quite a year but in a, an incredibly positive way and i think that notion of taking a look at yourself and reassessing your values is a really big part of what this whole conversation around brown purpose really is about ultimately right mm -hmm, exactly and and thank you for i saw us getting some comments through on that so thank you and if you would like hannah it will actually add a link here um in uh should put a comment about membership and we would love to we are constantly we're reviewing every month and we always welcome new members new voices and new people to transform the industry for the better so then I think, right, 
it goes without saying really that any efforts made towards brand purpose they need to be meaningful authentic and evidently aligned with the values of the brand so that's what it all is going to come down to today yeah. those making sweeping statements this year and there were many of them without being able to back them by progress or actions um also and i mean internally as well as externally um they falter it's tokenistic and it's performative the worst thing you can do is be tokenistic this was the overarching resounding conclusion of our round table if your purpose from a marketing perspective doesn't align with your internal policies you risk being caught in the crossfire uh, consumers will easily see through half-hearted attempts and if you're going to do it do it well essentially um when it comes to luxury fashion which is a space that i've worked in really for all of my career in fashion um i need to i think we all need to confront here as well that luxury fashion is elitist it is hierarchical it is aspirational what does that word mean what is aspirational mm -hmm. in 2020 post pandemic post black lives matter um it also we need to confront intersectional environmentalism which Rachel and I have spoken about at length on the sustainability instagram live particularly the one about sustainability post pandemic um so luxury brands despite the price tag they are they are still often culprits of not examining their supply chain well enough and not paying their workers a living wage or let's also look at the fact that many luxury brands have um notoriously exploited cultures in their collections for many many years in no cultures that are of ethnic minorities so there has been progress beyond the black squares i'm going to cite two i'm not saying they're perfect but in july chanel hired its first ever global head of diversity and inclusion her name is her name is fiona padgetta um it has committed 1 million us dollars to support grassroots racial justice organizations then there's gucci which i'm sure lots of you know have its change makers um that's well established but they now recently have created a 5 million us dollar fund to benefit 16 community based organizations including houston's writers in the schools and los angeles black aids institute however I feel it's too early to start highlighting brands as best in class mm -hmm. certainly in the luxury sector. I think we need to see how this all plays out. Um Rachel outside of the luxury sector though, I think there is opportunity to highlight best in class. I really do. What tell me what your eye what what's caught your eye there? Yeah, I mean I think from my perspective it's really nice also to think about the not just the intention and the messaging but also the creativity that have gone into some of these things and i think from a marketing standpoint there were some really interesting examples of this if you're looking at it through that lens mm -hmm. um and you're thinking about best practice as really good the sort of case studies and again particularly around black lives matter nike was one example um they released basically the equivalent of a public service announcement um and they did it by twisting their usual slogan of obviously just do it and instead said for once don't do it um and talked about um you know uh not being racist essentially and whether you liked it or not which is 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 kind of not my point here because obviously there are, there will be people that that didn't didn't like that particular message itself um and we're going to come on to the sort of commercial side of the work and the th potential virtue signaling that all of this insinuates in a, in a little bit but what i found super interesting about this is that the cause and the moment transcended the usual politics of business Um, and this is because Adidas basically took what Nike did and the examples on Twitter, and they basically retweeted the exact video from Nike with the comment, "Together is how we move forward. Together is how we make change," which was phenomenal. You know, to actually see these two, mm. you know, sportswear giants, you know, arch rivals essentially, to in in many ways just very organically and fluidly collaborate. And I think it was really nice example to see competition being set aside for the greater good, if you will. Yeah. And there's yeah. a lot to be said about that. A lot of sort of, yeah, examples of the way that we can think creatively in a moment. To, um, you know, in many ways, if we're if we're looking at this, you know, not to be cynical, but from a pure PR perspective, it was genius. You know, it got a lot, <laughs> it got a lot of headlines. And you know, as I said, there are people that didn't like it, but you know, from that perspective, super interesting. And I think the point here is that 
you know, there's a lot of opportunity in all of this as well, which is important to remember as a marketer. There was a study back in 2018 from Accenture, which referred to purpose or the idea of taking a stand on issues as a brand as an opportunity to demonstrate competitive agility. And I thought that was a really great phrase, really, for, for aligning around all of this. And they said that consumers' expectations that brands align with their personal values is a challenge for companies that underestimated the bottom line impact of neglecting to stand for something bigger than what they sell or falsely to believe that they can avoid taking a position on hot button issues. So basically saying that you have to, you know, you have to think about these things. Now, of course, that's not possible on the sort of in the same way as Nike and Adidas, because not everybody has something as big as that up their sleeves, you know, from a scale point of view, it's, you know, probably mm -hmm. don't even have the teams that are able to focus on that. Um, or indeed, as you said, you know, perhaps they can't because it doesn't authentically align with them. You know, Nike and, and, and Adidas have got a lot of faults, but they've also got dedicated teams working on a lot yeah. of these issues internally as well and have done for a long time. And they've been called out for them a lot in the past and so forth previously, which have made that more of a focus. Um, but the point being, again, you know, it's not the case for everybody because a lot of brands haven't been able to do that groundwork before, as you mentioned. And so, of course, what we also saw, as you rightly said, is a lot of brands that did nothing or posted a black square in solidarity, mm. but then didn't. But I thought what was really interesting in our roundtable that was that people did agree that, you know, there it is sometimes that is sometimes OK, is what I'm trying to say, is like this this sort of idea that um, you, sort of different responses being met by different sorry the point is that there are different different stakeholders have different responses to these things um and for, for some of the people we talked to it was absolutely okay not to post because it wouldn't have been authentic to do so and it was more important to stay quiet you know and to to not try and take a position because it would it would seem that it was unauthentic or disingenuous or whatever um and so i think there's a respect that goes with that as well that if you haven't got the basis to back it up then it's it, it's okay to sort of sit and wait whilst you decide what to say or, or, or you figure it out some way around or another. However, the other side to that same argument, which was fascinating during our roundtable discussion, was that for some of the bigger brands, the challenge in that and what we acknowledge is that sometimes there is a huge internal demand for a response as well. And that's what I mean by saying that, that that stakeholder perspective. And that was especially the case around Black Lives Matter. And I think I think we've seen that many times before. But of course, with Black Lives Matter, it was so uniting of, of sort of the whole world really to respond to it. But mm. certainly within our sector, you know, that being the focus, that, the, the, the lens that we were looking at it through. It, you know, it was a really heightened example of that demand being there for like, you know, expectation from from external, you know, your consumers wanting you to be saying something, expecting you to be saying something, calling it out if you weren't. And I hadn't personally previously thought about that internal piece and about that pressure from your own employees yeah. to stand up and say something. And um, I think it's just really interesting to think about the fact that they want that recognition that things are being dealt with, that the co company is acknowledging what's happening in the world right now. And they're taking that acknowledgement of something like Black Lives Matter and saying, OK, we also need to deal with this internally. Um, and I think that's that's the, been the case for several years. You know, we're starting to see more and more and more that people want to work for brands that have values and purpose mm. in their heart that align with their own values. It's why we use Patagonia as an example all the time. You know, so many people say that, that that's for that very reason, you know, that it's a values led business. Um, and there's been loads of studies around this to kind of prove this being the case. You know, one says that more than 70 percent of employees in the US say they're more likely to choose to work at a company with a strong environmental agenda, for instance. Um, or another one that said 64 percent of millennials say they wouldn't take a job at a company that wasn't socially responsible. And it goes on, you know, there's lots and lots of examples of the same thing. The point being that that's becoming a decision making factor in in what job you go for. And I think that's particularly it's particularly resonating this year, you know, through through the toughness as well, that people are actually thinking about their values and how they align. And we did really see that play out this year. You know, there were a lot of employees that were really calling out, especially previous employees. We saw it with Condé Nast was a massive example, you know, that went to town across the media with previous employees sharing their experiences of what it was like working 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 at the brands and um, there's people commenting here about the the brands that mm. they that they wouldn't want to work for and I, I totally understand it so i think the point here is that there's a lot of work to be done around purpose around values 
as much for your employees as your customers. And I think it's really important that we've, we've got to recognize that those two things go hand in hand. And it's too easy often to forget that, um, you know, stakeholders incorporate all of those, all of those things and not just one single audience at a time, if that makes sense. Yeah, and also I want to say I'm really enjoying Brand Purpose obviously has got everyone fired up. We're getting some really fascinating comments and questions through questions Hannah is going to be noting down for us and we can answer towards the end. And then um, Sarah Moa, who um, is just one of the most brilliant fashion journalists and I've seen she's tuning in. Hi, Sarah. Um, she commented that competitive brands and the very notion of brands being competitors is part of the problem. Um, and you mentioned that about Nike and Adidas, and that is obviously a great coup that they did that. And, and it's a very striking PR story. But actually for brands to have, I mean, you and I experienced it the whole time with sustainability. The only way to a truly sustainable future of the industry is collaboration. That's why we had our Absolutely. emergency designer network discussion between Holly, Bethany, Phoebe English and Cazette. Um, so... I, I hear you, Sarah. Um, and then, and then if we go back, yeah, if we go back to the internal external conundrum, um, what I found fascinating is particularly the rise and fall of Reformation over the summer, um, and then the subsequent resignation of their CEO, um, who's called Yale Aflalo. Aflalo, can't pronounce her right, but anyway, um, so. Reformation, this is a brand that had the, a very good PR line. Um, the best thing is to go naked and we're second best or something along those lines. Now, I was always a bit, I found that quite suspect because quite frankly, the price point really, are the, were those clothes truly, are those clothes truly sustainable? I, I certainly question it. But then more impactfully, what came out is um, an ex-employee and then various other employees called out the CEO on social media for her racism towards them. Some of the stories, actually, you can go back and Google them. They are despicable and really upsetting. Um, and then Diet Prada, who is both an industry watchdog and, and I kind of say a whistleblower as well, caught this story and amplified it. Um, and I think this amplification of brand purpose gone wrong has been really integral to uh, to changes this year for certain. Um, it take influencer culture and the cancel culture surrounding that. Rachel and I have spoken before about Arielle Charnas and her behavior at the start of lockdown. Um, you know, she's an influencer with millions of followers and she was clearly um, just laughing in the face of any regulation and exploiting her privilege. Um, and that caused, the, that caused her to be canceled. Um, in that kind of well-known phrase. And she also was called a COVIDiot. That, that was attributed to her. Um, overall, social media has the power for individuals and brands to make their voices heard, which can often be for the good, like that ex-employee of Reformation. But it also has the power to take brands and individuals down within moments. And that brings me to a really important learning from our roundtable discussion. Social media is an imperfect place to be having these conversations. It is really hard to boil these issues down into one post or one comment. You know, these are captions of 2,200 characters. Can we really say all that we need to say about Black Lives Matter, about our attitude to coronavirus and the politics around it, just within that tiny space? Um, time has to be spent unraveling the issues at the heart. Yeah, I couldn't mean, I mean, I, I totally agree. And I also think it's about the fluidity of social, you know, as well, and, and how, sort of, mm. how quick, how quick things move through it. And, and, and it is difficult. I mean, we've seen a lot in the way of cancel culture this year, that's very, very negative, too. And I think that's important to, to, to acknowledge, and, and certainly isn't the answer here, either. Um, as you rightly said, social media is an incredibly complex landscape. And it's so important yes. for us to remember that within the context of this discussion, because it very easily kind of gets um yeah r remove from as part of it you know it's, it's sort of our primary medium these days and it's it's um it's a really difficult one um yeah to carly's point carly's just commented there no nuance on social media yeah um it's 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 true and it's really really hard um and i find it very interesting to think about how this landscape has developed in that regard you know 
brand purpose, as we mentioned before, is not a new focus at all for, for brands. We've been talking about things like tapping into pop culture as social media managers and um, thinking about alignment with social movements and obviously broader values um, throughout the entire existence of all of these platforms. Um, a couple of years ago, I gave a talk at the British Fashion Council's forum and I spoke about the idea of the brand manager being dead. Um, but the brand activist has sort of risen up in their place. Um, mm. And that was related to messages like, you know, Gucci standing for gun control or, or excuse me, all the work that Ben and, Ber ben and Jerry's has done in this space. Um, Rimmel at the time was doing something around cy anti-cyberbullying and the body shop, shop was hosting activist hubs within all its stores. Um, right. And then at, around that same time, Sephora was shutting its stores to host inclusivity training. So really interesting, you know, there's been a lot of work already done in this space. Um, and there's of course, loads and loads of people getting it wrong, um, which is largely what we tend to remember the most. But there's also a lot that's being done more broadly that is really positive. Um, so I find it really interesting, like you would have thought that more of the legwork would have been done on that authenticity piece as we started with today already because of all of that, especially on the diversity and inclusion side of things, because that's so pivotal to the industry. Um, to this industry um, and I feel perhaps that we've been really talking about it for such a long time you know diversity and inclusion particularly is not not a new topic of this year black lives matter mm -hmm. is not a new topic of this year um, but clearly that hasn't turned into enough action which I guess is the whole point of all of this that now we really really do need to see that being the case um, and I think as a result so much of what has happened this year in terms of the brand responses that we've mentioned and indeed all of that stakeholder pressure that I've suggested has actually just been quite reactive, which is why it's maybe not been as strong as it could have been. And I'm sort of wondering, like, why wasn't there, you know, as far as being competent marketers go, why wasn't there a better plan in place already to sort of deal with these kinds of situations? And I understand that it sort of all came to a head within a crisis, but it does feel in many ways quite mind blowing that there wasn't something for a lot of brands, you know, beyond the ones we saw do it well for a lot mm. more brands that was a lot stronger and it just sort of proves that whole walking the talk rather than just talking it is so crucial here. Mm -hmm. I mean, the brands who've done it the best had the tools and the teams in place to respond mm. and, and do it, do so in a considered way. Um, Cause that was a moment of crisis and preparation and proactivity have proven absolutely crucial nobody wants to be making a sweeping a, a grand statement in crisis because you can't make a, a decent decision in a moment of crisis um a reflection is key and those who have placed that purpose at the core of their strategy and have done so for many years are the ones who have been best placed um a crisis is no time to make rush decisions it is no time to make commitments um at best they won't come to fruition and at worst, they will damage the reputation of the company. I think companies that incorporate purpose into the heart of their brand ethos have been the most successful at handling these, these big issues. Um, so for me, I really do see success in direct consumer, um, young brands, Allbirds, for example, I think always does get this brand purpose very well, but that's at the heart of their brand and, and it has been from mm -hmm. the start. But then equally, it's not just the young brands. Um, I listened to a brilliant How I Built This with the founder of Lush the other day. And, you know, Lush is a well-established brand. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a recent one. And they're well-established. And, and they deal with these moments of, they, they deal with the, the, basically, brand purpose runs right through to the core. So they are well-equipped to deal with these moments of crisis and to know how to, rather like an individual would, if an individual had, had, was well-read and, and had done all that educational side of things, they would know how to respond. Um, mm. Yeah, Rachel, what's your take on it throwing it back to you. I mean I just find it I just find it really interesting there the examples that you've given because it's a really it's a really yeah. good point I feel like we've that sort of balance between the establishment and the sort of traditional businesses but then that meaning that maybe there's a process in place and being able to establish these things versus the direct consumer brands and you're right with the example you've given as being very strong but I, I think we've really seen this year in many ways not necessarily the downfall that's probably a little bit too an extreme in word but certainly lots of call outs of direct to consumer brands where because they are yeah. so start up in their nature if you think about it you know reformation everlane away museum of ice cream all of those businesses have had significant issues come to light over the last not, yeah. not just this year you know in the past couple of years come come to light because of the way that um 
the, the workplace culture, I think, is a really big part of it, which is which is incredibly mm. interesting. Um, but the, the other point I wanted to make, and, and just sort of, you know, mentioned this earlier, is what I find really interesting about this is where it then all crosses with the commercials. And it's a bit like when we talk about the greenwashing side of things, and to, to, to Sarah's point in the comments, you know, about this idea of competition being part of the issue. I think it's really interesting to think about how far do you go to align yourself with a really important social or cultural moment and then also say, oh, no, oh, yeah, um, can you please buy our trainers? Or, you know, here's, yeah. here's a dress on sale. Or like, you know, oh, yeah, Black Lives Matter in one moment. Oh, and here's 30% discount kind of thing. And that is just like, it's so at odds with each other. Um, and I do really think we've seen a lot of virtue signaling happening this year on that very basis, which isn't okay. And I, I guess that comes back to that authenticity piece again of all of it. But arguably, I think anything that we're looking at that brand is about brand purpose. When your ultimate gender, as it is with all of these businesses, is to try and convince people to shift product is, mm. is pure virtue signaling. And I think we have to kind of accept that. Like, there's no two ways around it. Like, that, that, is, that is what it is. You know, you're ultimately, there's an, there's an ulterior motive with what you're doing, um, which is to shift product. Now, you know, there is some wider thinking around, you know, why do you exist as a business? And if it's for the sake of your employees and everything else, maybe it's a different, slightly different view on these things. And it's about the, I think if you can really prove the social welfare side of things, maybe we're in a slightly different place. But yes, yeah, somebody's just said woke washing. Sure. Exactly. That's the phrase I've been looking for. Thank you. It's so true. <laughs> but I think maybe my point is perhaps within all of this, what we're uncovering is that there's really good, if I can say this as a phrase, there are good and bad ways to do the virtue signaling there are good and bad ways to woke wash um no there's not woke washing full stop is bad but i think maybe you know there's always going to be consumers that are are cynical but i don't know do you agree are there are there good and bad ways of doing this yeah i think first of all it's worth saying there's a generation who just doesn't care about brands having yeah. a purpose or certainly clothing brands um my the the boomer generation i don't want to make sweeping statements but my my mum on I really she when she she's there to buy a product she's not there to care about the brand ethos so this is yeah. but we're the new generation coming through and it does matter to most of us so flagging that aside I think commerciality and fundraising can and should be aligned and we have seen circumstances of that working well this year however I think what needs to stop and this year has brought attention to it, and this was mentioned by many on our round table conversation, is this idea of 10% of profits from our clearly not organic cotton, appallingly made by uh, underpaid workers t-shirt will go to with a charity. Now, 10% of profits, it's probably you're looking at a couple of pence half the time. And yes, I think far too often that has um, been a way for brands to uh wash woke wash perhaps if we're going to use that term again but certainly uh pull the wool a little bit over the consumer eye and um i find they particularly come out at christmas this idea of um you buy and you give back and yet buying to give often actually the charity initiative is so minute compared to the commercial gain of the company um so I feel like brands are still navigating this success versus virtue signaling space. Um, and I think it'll be interesting to see it unfold. If you can get your community externally and internally behind a charity initiative and involved, I mean, look at how well the example at the beginning, Anushka raising a quarter of a million yeah. for the Prince's Trust. I mean, that's incredible. And that will have happened because those invested in the brand both as customers or as internal staff or as influencers have got behind it and hosted their own mm. but um yeah the 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 tokenistic charity t-shirt thing it stinks this year yeah it does i mean for for many many reasons on top of mm. that i completely couldn't i couldn't agree more so we want to open up to questions but i guess just to conclude a little bit i think you know, this year has really really demonstrated that First of all, no single brand is perfect. Um, I love mm. Carly's comment here that um, amazing yet not surprising how many brands realize they didn't have a purpose when they struggled to find a position on the important issues. And that's so, so true. So I think the question now is, how are you utilizing your time today? You know, given all the learnings of this year, how are you building on your mistakes? How are you building on those learnings? And how are you truly integrating values into your core, into the core of your business? And I guess 
if you believe that that's right for you because maybe it's not for every single brand but certainly the action part of it you know it doesn't need to be in your messaging but the action part making sure that you have um you know particularly that inclusive workforce i think is is really really crucial um i think from my perspective the fact is today that good companies if there is such a phrase good companies have to incorporate social and environmental justice every which way round. i think we're at a crunch time where just existing for profit isn't enough anymore and you're going to get caught out and called out for it at some point if you haven't been already and i think purpose is so pivotal at this time you know people planet purpose being those sort of three main p's we need to think about way more so than that other one that i mentioned and I think also thinking about your externalities, you know, all of your stakeholders and not just the notion of shareholder capitalism is is really important mm. currently. And I think it's a huge change that we're starting to confront. And I think that sort of that notion of of a transition and a transformation that is that is needed is is a really interesting one. And I, I really hope that we're going to see it happen I think it needs leadership in a really big way. And I think that's the other thing to say here, that it's, it needs a lot of vision. Um, but there are examples of it starting to happen, which are incredibly positive. And to end, one of our members said the most amazing line that I cannot tell you how many times I've repeated it since. She said to us, never waste a good crisis. And I will name drop her here, Rachel Bremer, thank you so much, because that literally, I just love it. I think it's so good because for me, this crisis is an opportunity to change. Like. Here's 2020, because while it's been a rotten year in so many ways, I think it can lead to progress. And that's ultimately what is needed with all of this. So on that no. note. Um, thank you all very much for watching. And also, if there's a topic you'd like us to cover, do always DM. We'd love to hear from you. Um, and have a great evening, everyone. Thank you finally to our sponsor once more, Clavio. Uh, you are brilliant. Great. Thanks. Thank you very much, Rachel. Thank you, Rosanna. Right. Thank you, everyone, for being here. See you next time. Bye. Bye.